You want something. You want to you want to find so you'll seek. How hard are you going to seek? Hi, Jord. Hi, Tam. Welcome to my podcast. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. So today I'd like to talk about the self-authoring program, which I found very helpful. And um, I'd like to know exactly how it came about to begin. Yeah, well, we talked about talking about helping people develop a vision and why that's so important. And this is something I tried to develop with my colleagues to make that vision concrete. I worked on it to begin with, with my advisor, Dr. Robert Peel, and also a graduate student, colleague of mine now, Dr. Daniel Higgins, who was an MIT engineer who then, a uh, master's degree engineer from MIT, and then came and did a PhD with me at Harvard. And uh, Bob and I, uh, I started working with Bob, Robert O. Peel, in 1985. And he had an, he was a very interesting person to me. Um, I didn't really know much about being a graduate student. I didn't know anybody who'd ever been a graduate student, I don't think, at that time. So I was pretty ignorant, and uh, at least on that front. And Bob was a very admirable person. It was brave of him to take me. I wrote a fairly strange letter of application, an ambitious letter of application. And he was a very good administrator and a good manager and had an encyclopedic research knowledge and was very detail-oriented, but also imaginative and extremely confident. He really liked his graduate students and was a great mentor to them. And so we had an unbelievably productive relationship. And we were interested in, um, in the research we did on alcoholism and antisocial personality, but we were also interested in developing low-cost, effective, and commercially marketable psychological interventions that would also work on the entrepreneurial front. When I went off to teach in Boston at Harvard, you and I were in some what of financial straits at that point, if you remember, we moved down there and the professorship salaries for assistant professors were really weren't adequate for you and I to live on. No, not and I really. had no green card, and, you and couldn't I had work. babies. Yeah, and yeah. so I had to do a lot of extra teaching. Now, I'm not complaining or whining about that, but I, I had twice the t teaching load that, in some sense, I should have had if I was going to pursue my research career, which hypothetically was what I was hired to do, as well as to teach. And so I phoned the dean one day, and I said, I don't know what you guys are thinking about, but you don't pay your assistant professors enough to live in the Boston area which I thought was rather appalling because Harvard has an endowment that's, you know, country-sized, not university-sized, and there's really no excuse for it. But on the other hand, they are Harvard, and if they ask you to teach there, no one says no. So, fair enough, sort of. I said, well, how do people do this? And he said, well, most of our people consult. And I thought, that's complete bloody rubbish. None of your junior professors consult because they don't have the connection network, and they don't have the time. So, but I thought, okay, well, maybe I know something that has some economic value. What might that be? Bob and I had produced this battery of neuropsychological tests, cognitive tests, uh, for assessing people's proclivity to antisocial behavior. We thought there might be a cognitive element to that, inability to control impulses, for example, and you might be able to detect that by using specialized tests of cognitive ability. And so we built this battery of tests a lot of them used machines uh, with lights and levers and so forth, problem-solving exercises. And the whole battery required, we, we based it on tests that were developed at the Montreal Neurological Institute to test people who had prefrontal cortical damage. And a lot of, that whole battery of tests required about 11 hours and a trained clinician to administer. And I thought, well, maybe we could use those to assess basic competence, academic competence, industrial competence, entrepreneurial competence. And then I had a great graduate student, Daniel Higgins, who I've also now worked with for now 30 years, almost as long as I worked with Bob. And he was a computer programmer and an MIT engineer. And so I worked with him on computerizing all these tasks. This was back in 1993 when this first became possible. This was right when the net emerged. Netscape came out, I think, in 1993, and everyone knew that was going to, that was going to be something. 
So Daniel and I put together this battery and we, we shrunk the administration time from 11 hours to an hour and a half and uh, and then we did a bunch of experiments showing that we could predict academic performance over and above IQ, arguably, depending on how you did the analysis, and that we could also predict managerial ability. Um, we, we predicted academic performance at Harvard and the University of Toronto with quite a degree of accuracy, and then we could also predict managerial ability and, uh, and also uh, line worker ability. Different, different factors. We also put together a personality battery, battery testing extroversion, neuroticism, conscientiousness, agreeableness, and openness. And different things predicted different capabilities. Well, what predicts a manager? Um, conscientiousness and IQ. Basically. And what about an, uh, a line work? Mostly conscientiousness. Uh, cognitive ability, so the neuropsych ability, predicts how fast you learn the task, but if it's a repetitive task, once you learn it, cognitive ability doesn't predict performance, but conscientiousness does. And on the entrepreneurial front, it's cognitive ability again, plus uh, um, openness, which is the creativity dimension. Anyways, we, we put together this battery, and at the same time I was reviewing literature that indicated the staggering economic value of improving employee selection. So, because a small proportion of your employees do almost all the productive work, if you can tilt your hiring so that you pick up more of those employees, you get a disproportionate return on investment. And it's really, it's an insane return. So... What do you do with the people who are under... Well, that's what I was asked. So we went out, Bob and I went out on the road for 10 years to conferences, business conferences. We were fish out of water, us academics, because we didn't know anything about business. And people were skeptical of academics in the business world. And we thought, because we had a test battery that worked, and we had demonstrated its validity scientifically, and we had the data showing what the economic return would be. So at that point, I think it was Hunter, a psychologist at UMich, this is a long time ago, so I'm not sure, calculated that if the US federal government used accurate selection tests to do its hiring, replacing its personnel, that they would save an amount equivalent to total American corporate profits every year. The return on this is staggering. It could be as high if the test cost $20 to administer and you administer them to 100 people to select an employee, so $2,000, you'd probably get a 200 to 1 return on that the first year. And so, in our naivety, Bob and I thought, well, why in the world would you not buy that? There's nothing you could do, literally, that would increase the productivity of your employees and the profitability of your company faster than that, period. Here's the data. But what we didn't know at all was that middle managers in corporations don't make decisions based on data because they can't do the data analysis and they don't know if they can trust you and they don't know you because you haven't played golf with them or gone out for dinner with them or established a personal relationship. And I'm not denigrating that. Mm -hmm. There are different ways of assessing people's competence. And researchers assess your competence on the basis of data and scientific analysis, but that's not how mid-managers in corporate businesses do it. Or politicians. They, or politicians, or anybody but scientists for that matter. Physicians don't do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to be trained as a scientist to do that, and that actually takes, really, if you're smart, that takes six years. It's really hard to start thinking in a data-oriented way. And so, we thought that the argument was self-evident, but it wasn't, and then, and so we ran into the problem that we didn't know anything about the culture that we were in and misread the signals. And then we also found out that it wasn't obvious that corporations actually wanted tests that worked. They wanted tests that made everybody feel good after they took them, like the Myers-Briggs say, because everybody wins. And you know, it does promote an interesting discussion about personality. And then the HR types, this is when I learned about the pathology of human resources way before this became a diversity, inclusivity and equity world. The HR types just hated us because they really didn't believe in competence. They were def generally underqualified and underpowered and resentful. And they believed that you could train anybody to do any job. And all of those things are miserably false. Plus, they saw us as a threat. And so even if we did get through the middle managers who didn't have any decision-making capacity anyways, then we'd hit HR and just we just ran into a wall. <laughs> there was no getting past HR. And 
we kept being asked the same question, which was, well, what do we do with the employees that we have that aren't performing very well? And our answer was, well, there's nothing you can do. The management literature indicates that you should spend all your time with your high performers and none of your time with people who aren't performing well because as a manager with your limited time and ability and knowledge on the psychological front how in the world are you going to help people who are in trouble? You just can't do it. You, you don't have the resources or the knowledge and there's no indication that you can help them but it's definitely the case that in most corporations, most organizations, a small minority of troubled people or troublemaking people take up all the resources. They can just sink your company. So our, our advice was stop hiring people like that. But it wasn't really great advice because first of all people weren't going to do that because we had a hell of a time selling our tests. I eventually ended up working with uh, the Founder Institute which is an early stage tech incubator and we tested tens of thousands of people for them and helped them start I don't know how many thousand businesses around the world. Th literally thousands of businesses and that worked out fine but it was real hard go on the sales front and we just learned that we just learned we didn't know enough to sell and we also learned that if you have a marketable product you've solved 15% of your problem at best the sales and marketing which is actually communication and the building of social networks so it shouldn't be reduced to sales and marketing that's in, in some sense a way more difficult problem than just coming up with something that's useful and that was a hard lesson for us to learn because we thought at the beginning well, we'll hire salespeople and it'll be 15% commission for them and 85% for us and that was literally backwards anyways, the HR types and, and the managers kept saying when they did talk to us and we talked to hundreds of them, we did this for a long time it was very painful learning because we were so ignorant and outsiders and we're out of our element, you know, mm -hmm. and that was uncomfortable for both Bob and I because we were used to being, well, professors at McGill and at Harvard, fairly reasonable status positions and we're pretty firmly ensconced in those worlds and so to go to a place where we were neophytes and fools in some sense was daunting but it was good to spend time with Bob and that helped a lot in any case, we kept being asked, well, what do we do with these people who aren't doing well and the answer, we don't know and you shouldn't have them hired, that's not, wasn't a great answer so I thought, okay, we're being told by our customers what's actually desirable here and it isn't what we thought, it's remediation, not selection um, so I scoured the psychological literature and we looked, and I talked this over with Daniel more particularly, we, we wanted to build an intervention that was very inexpensive but that we would fund pub privately that was scalable infinitely, that required no bureaucratic administration, that didn't do any harm and that was based on the best available scientific evidence and so I went into the literature with those goals in mind and I found on the cognitive front what people could do to maintain or enhance their cognitive ability as they age, because your cognitive ability declines, is exercise there's nothing better than physical exercise cognitive exercises, um, they don't work they don't make you any smarter but exercise, physical, cardiovascular and weightlifting improves your cardiovascular fitness and that keeps your brain healthy and that keeps you from degenerating as you age mm -hmm. and at 50 you can revert your cognitive ability back to 30 year old levels with a good course of exercise so, so that was interesting but then the other thing we found, two things, was that um, writing seemed to help people um, and writing about past difficult experiences, traumas, to use a word that's been beat to death past traumatic experience, writing diligently about past, or even badly for that matter merely writing about past traumatic experiences seemed to be a little distressing in the short run, two weeks or so, but beneficial physically and psychologically three to six months down the road, and there was 30 research articles indicating how that how did you measure that? Um, the physical improvements were measured by number of times people went to visit the physician and then the psychological measures were various measures of mental health, mostly uh, susceptibility to depression and anxiety and so, and so imagine that you can detect a traumatic memory by 
reviewing your autobiography and noting that you have memories that are older than 18 months, there's a reason for that, older than 18 months, that still cause you emotional distress when they appear in the theater of your imagination. And so what that means is, your brain has marked the territory that's represented by those memories as dangerous. And that's what the anxiety system does. And your brain doesn't like noticing that you've been in places that you couldn't master. So it marks those as potential trouble. And the marking is the re remnant emotional significance of the memory. Danger here, danger here. Those obsessive recurring anxiety provoking memories is an alarm system in your brain saying, you might go here again, you might go here again, beware, so beware. So it's your old self telling you in the present that there's danger. That there's still danger because right. even though only, there isn't, well, there there may still be, but if there you, may not. Well, be, there it won't still be. Happens. If, there won't be if you don't go there. But you had been there, and that means you might be there again. And so, what your emotional systems want to see is that you've mastered all the territories that you've encountered. And mastery means that when you go you've somewhere, matured. you've matured. Partly. Partly that you've developed the requisite competence to right. navigate through that landscape right, And right. it's a navigation problem so that you have a map that will guide you in that territory without Without trouble on your part mm -hmm. and all the places you've been where there are pitfalls are marked in your memory by remaining negative emotion and that actually that actually causes chronic stress so imagine that one of the things your body tries to do your emotional systems is to calculate the proportion of territory that you've been in that's dangerous compared to productive and safe. Okay, the more it's productive and safe, the less stress you carry. Because your psychophysiological self assumes safety. And it lets you dispense with emergency preparation. But if everywhere you've gone there's been trouble, then you're like this, all the time, and that makes you old. And the reason it makes you old is because it's too physiologically demanding. You're burning up excess resources all the time, being ready for the next catastrophe. And so, if your past is full of unresolved traumas, we'll, and we'll get to what that means, then your psychophysiological self and your emotional systems are going to assume that the environment is dangerous and they're going to keep you in a state of chronic hyper-preparation. Now, if you go back to those old memories and you plot a new course, like let's say you were bullied when you were a kid, right? And so you're still leery of people in some fundamental sense. But maybe you don't have to be, because let's say, well, when I was a kid, for example, I didn't get bullied a lot, but I got Everybody does to some degree, and so what did I get bullied about? Well, I was small. You were young. And I was young for my age, yeah, young for my grade, because yeah. I had skipped a grade, yeah. and I was small despite that. And I was less athletically able because I was smaller and younger. And so when I ran into bullies, those were the uh, aspects of my being that they would capitalize on. And so, but now I'm not like that. I'm not young for my grade. I'm not small. Um, and, and I'm as athletic as I need to be. So carrying that is not helpful because I've actually solved the problems that produced those, right. those experiences. But you, and that's what your brain wants to see, your psychophysiological self. It wants to see that you've solved the problem. Now, so if you go back and you think, well, I'm still scared of people. Well, why am I scared of people? Well, because when I was young, here are the limitations I had. Mm -hmm. But I no longer have those limitations and none of those dangers exist. And now I've thought that through. Now you have a map of that territory, hey? Eh? That's hippocampally instantiated, by the way. That's the part of the brain that inhibits the amygdala, which is an emotion center. And now the brain can say, okay, we'll just shut off the residual hyper-preparation associated with that danger. So you go back through your whole past, eh? And you figure out where the pitfalls were, 
And then you see as an adult, if you've generated new strategies of representation and navigation that would enable you to bypass those problems in the present and the future. So you can do that pragmatically. Yeah. But what about if they, you said they cause you emotions. Mm -hmm. These are things that cause you emotions. Yeah, because otherwise they're not a problem. And so right? how, are you, how do you change the emotional response that you have? Well, if you're, no longer, if you're no longer susceptible to the danger, and you now know that, then the emotion will disappear on its own. So this was tested by a man named James Pennebaker. So it's a very good question, by the way. Pennebaker tested the Freudian theory of redemptive catharsis. And so catharsis is emotional expression. Now Freud basically believed, although Freud was sophisticated, that people were damaged often because of terrible things that had happened to them as they developed. It's not such a shocking hypothesis, and sometimes people have really terrible things happen to them. And he noted that if, you, if people got a chance to talk about these things, that sometimes that would make them better. Now that was a shock to everyone that even a physiological disorder could be cured by talking but if you think it through it makes sense it's like well people had problems talking is thinking thinking is problem solving solved problems don't cause trouble hence cure but that isn't really how Freud construed it he believed that it was the emotional expression that the emotions associated with the event had been suppressed or repressed and that the reason people were still carrying them because they didn't have a chance to fully express the emotion that's the theory of catharsis and Pennebaker tested that so he brought people into the lab and he had people write on three consecutive days for 20 minutes about the worst thing that had ever happened to them or I believe the worst thing they had ever done because that can also traumatize you and then he had a control group just write about like a normal childhood experience to control for writing and then Pennebaker showed that the people who wrote about the traumatic experiences had these beneficial physical and psychological outcomes. Didn't matter what they wrote? Um, yes, he did a content analysis. And so, and this is, he's a very sophisticated researcher, James Pennebaker. I interviewed him on my YouTube channel. He wanted to find out what predicted what produced health. And he had two competing hypotheses, really. One was the emotional catharsis hypothesis, and the other was more of a cognitive restructuring hypothesis. And so, he analyzed words that were associated with emotion, like sadness and anxiety and frustration and disappointment. He coded all these emotion words, and also words that coded for deeper understanding, enlightenment, insight, um, and that sort of thing. And then what he found was that the more people used words indicating cognitive insight, the better they got, right. which indicated that it wasn't the catharsis, it wasn't the emotional expression that was the key issue. It was the reconfiguration of the memories so that they were more, so that the new representation was more adaptively appropriate. What makes it a new representation though? You know, what if, what if you're, uh, something happened and you're very angry about it and all you want to talk about is how angry you are for like 10 pages? How is well, that that's helpful? A, well, how is that helpful? It, it's hard to say how that might be helpful because maybe that you're angry about something that happened when you were four. Right. Well, could you think it through when or you were four? Or from four till you were 15. Well, could be. Well, hopefully you're more verbally astute and you have more analytic and practical tools at your disposal now. So when you revisit that, you can bring to bear on the situation all those new faculties that you have in as, a, as an adult. Like, you may still be thinking about this, it's highly probable this is Freudian fixation. Let's say something terrible happened to you when you were 11 and you really didn't get past it. Mm -hmm. Well, you still have an 11 year old's representation of that, but you're like 30, so maybe your dad was mean to you. But now you know that he had a history of depression and that he was uh, beat up badly at the hands of his father. And, but you didn't know that when you were 11, and even if you did, how helpful would that be? But now you're 30, and you're looking back, and you think, well, my dad was hard on me, you know, and, but it was worse when he was feeling bad, and that wasn't necessarily his fault, and also he had a terrible relationship with his dad, and, and here's the good things he did, and the things he helped me with, and beside that, 
he, we've repaired our relationship in the interim, maybe you have or maybe you haven't, and I'm no longer susceptible to that kind of bullying in any case. Right, so and, that sounds to me like br broadening out the uh, relationship, so the relationship was narrow, 11 year old uh, look on this person, yep. and now you're saying, no, no, there's also positive uh, personality attributes that I hadn't taken into yep. consideration, that I didn't, there's history that I didn't know, and so you're making them into a person rather than into an event. Yeah, or a stereotype. In, yeah. Well, with my dad, for example, my dad and I clashed a reasonable amount when I was about 13 till I was about 16 when I left home. We had a very good relationship before that and after. And dad was harsh during that period of time, I would say, and he was also ill in some ways that made him less patient than he might be but by the same token um, I was somewhat resentful I didn't take advantage of all the things in the small town that that I was offered that I could have taken advantage of I didn't go play tennis or that sort of thing I could have taken music lessons with a person who offered it to me and I didn't and my friends were like quasi delinquents and they were not that trustworthy in the house and so Dad had his reasons to be um, difficult to get along with at times. I knew that he supported me, and we had had a lovely relationship up to then. So our fundamental relationship remained intact. But when I look back on that, even by the time I was 18, I knew that whatever trouble I might have encountered with him was at least half due to me. And some of that realization was a consequence of maturation. And as soon as you, as soon as you have a, see, memory isn't a photograph or a movie of something that happened. It's an ongoing interpretation of life. You know, when you when you experience the present, you experience it with a bunch of interpretations and a bunch of assumptions, and you take your best guess. And the past is like that too. And. When, and a memory is like that. A memory is, a memory is your assumption about what happened. Mm -hmm. And those assumptions can be erroneous and they can be challenged. And, well, a lot of the therapeutic process is exactly that. Um, and you have to be careful because you can delude people about their, about their memories as well because they're so malleable. You have to be very careful if you're a therapist not to twist and bend the memories to suit your diagnostic purposes. The reason you're suffering is because you were sexually abused as a child. That's the a priori presumption. Then I'll twist your memories until you come up with, a, with an account that, that suffices to show me that I'm right. Especially for people who are confused, man, you can do that. Implant false memories, so to speak. There's a whole literature on false so memories. So how syndrome. does the self-authoring work in that vein and do a better job of it than the... Well, it asks you to go through your life and to to first of all do it programmatically, right? So I think it asks you to divide your life into seven or eight epochs, so eras, let's say. And some people might do that, uh, you know, kindergarten or birth to kindergarten, kindergarten to grade two, grade two to grade five. They'll do it by, by external markers of social belonging, let's say. I had people who I noticed this in my practice, that people would parse up their lives in different ways. Some people talk about their lives in terms of their sequential relationships. That's how they construe the adventures of their life. That was probably more true for women than for men. And so you can parse it up any way you want with the self-authoring program, but it asks you to the past authoring program, because there's a past, present, and future program. The past program asks you to delineate the emotional experiences of those epochs both positive and negative, and then to try to understand what you did that was right and helpful and what you did that was wrong and unhelpful and to, well, and that's, that's pretty much all, is to get clear about exactly what happened. And, and then the present authoring? The present authoring presents you with a list of virtues and faults, adjectives, and it asks you to circle the virtues and to circle the faults, it's two parts. So imagine you have a hundred virtues. And you, you uh, the person who's Describing it writes the virtues or no, are they, you, they're you listed select them. there? Oh, I the see. virtues are already there. You select okay. them from a list. Yeah. And so then maybe there's, well, here's 16 virtues are I they have. Virtues. Name me some virtues. Um, uh, intelligent, creative, agreeable, conscientious, industrious, dutiful, that and sort faults? of thing. Hmm? Faults. Faults. Vengeful, deceitful, bitter. 
I see. cruel, okay. Uh, lazy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you get the idea. Yeah. Um, and you, you circle a bunch of them and then you rank order them. And then you address the top ones in the virtue category and the top ones in the fault category. And what you do with the virtues is say, okay, well, here's a virtue that characterizes me. Here's how it served me well in the past. So you detail out some narratives to anchor it. Here's what I could do to capitalize on that virtue in the future. Because it's an ally. It's what do you mean by that? How you could continue to use it in a beneficial way to move you forward into the future. Right? So let's say you're brave or you're honest or you're loving. Well, here's how that helped you in the past. Here's what you could do to make that even more helpful in the future. So something you could undertake? Yes, exactly. Okay, an exactly. action. An action, yeah, or okay. a strategy. Oh, okay. That's right, that's yeah. right. A lot of this is strategic. As you move from past to future, it becomes more strategic. And then on the faults front, same thing. Here's your list of canonical faults. Yeah. Here's yeah. how this has really Anger. hindered you in the past. Yeah. Yeah. And here's how you might ameliorate or redress that in the future. And, what, what, and how do you see that amelioration? Uh, because, you know, the, the blaming, the, so the catastrophe of the, catastrophe of the past and you're bringing it into the present and yep. then forecasting into the future something better. Well, I think the first part is wanting to. Like, let's mm -hmm. say you're resentful. Right. Well, everyone's resentful. And yeah. Let's say you have your reasons, because you probably right. do. Right. But is it helpful? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a part that is no. sort of like righteous <laughs> anger. There's a part that feels like it's a quest for justice. Yeah. But a lot of it is also... A temptation right to well I was hurt so badly that I don't care about other people and the world's a terrible place and I don't have to try and and that, that's right. the terrible temptation of bitterness is do you want to carry maybe you were tortured when you were a kid yes. or maybe you were tortured yesterday for that matter yeah how much of that weight do you want to carry forward into the future right maybe you could let go of that that's partly why you want to forgive right mm -hmm. it's like let go because otherwise you said it's very taxing physically as well right oh well, anger in particular. Mm -hmm. There's no emotion more psychophysiologically taxing than bitterness, anger, resentment. That, that why triad. is that? Do you think physically? Why is well, that because physically? first of all, you tend only to get anger, angry in situations where you're really at risk. So let's say you're preparing for a fight, right? Mm -hmm. So someone's made you angry and they're angry and maybe there's going to be a fight. Well, you just ramp up, yeah. man, because you better have your reactions at the ready and so you're just burning fuel and energy like mad getting ready to fight fight or flight mm -hmm. and that's a tremendous physiological load and it does make you old right, right? right. so it, it elevates your cortisol levels it takes all the blood sugar out of your blood because it prepares you for that it's unbelievably demanding mm -hmm. if you're in that state for a long period of time it, it can d damage key centers of the brain that are associated with emotional regulation like it's really bad news it will definitely make you old. And so if somebody, somebody is resentful about something, say they had a bad relationship with their mother or something, or, and uh, they're resentful towards their mom, but they have identified that as their fault and they want to bring it somewhere better, is that programmed into the self-authoring for well, them that to recognize the, that, that process? That would be the next part. Which is? So the third part is the future authoring oh, program, right? And mm -hmm. so. This is sort of like a life cleanup program see, in I some see, fundamental yeah. sense. Well, then, in the future authoring program, which is the one we've done the most research on, so it, if people do this for 90 minutes badly before they go to college, it'll decrease the probability they'll drop out in the first year by 50%. That's amazing. And it works particularly well for people who are most likely to drop out. So a lot of psychological interventions help the good performers do even better and don't help the bad performers that much. And why do you think it helps them more? Well, I think the good performers already have a bit of a vision and a plan. Uh. Whereas the bad performers, they're really ambivalent about what they're doing because they don't mm. have a plan. Mm. And we'll talk more about why this is so important. So if you don't have a reason to do something and then a reason not to do it comes up, well, then you'll just not do it because not doing things is real easy. You can just sit there and not do things all day. Doing things takes effort, and so any resistance is likely to, it pushes back against you. And so, going to college, it's like, well, why is that difficult? Well, you have to get up, you have to go to your classes, you have to do the assignments, 
you have to do the reading, you have to write the tests, you have to believe that this path is somehow better than any other path you could be on, and there's innumerable other paths, and that it's better in some fundamental sense than just doing nothing, or playing games, or, or, or being purely hedonic. So there's a lot of, because it's difficult, there's a lot of obstacles. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a reason, well, why would you overcome the obstacles? And so what happens when you do the future authoring program is two things. Is first of all, you construe yourself as the sort of person who could have a reason, right? Who could make a vision and impose it on the world. And how do you do that? Well and, then, well, and then second, you actually develop a vision. Okay, so the first thing the program asks you to do, and it's, it's got a biblical element to it in some fundamental sense, I, although that wasn't so explicit when we first developed it, but I came to realize that later. There's a statement in the Gospels, Christ says to his followers, um, ask and you'll receive. Knock and the door will open. Will open. Seek and you'll find. And you listen to that and you think, no, no way, man, it, it can't be that easy. Well, it's not it's that easy. Because let's think about what wanting means. You want something. You want to you find, so you'll seek. How hard are you going to seek? You know, maybe you're after the Holy Grail, right? You're after the gold in the dragon's lair, or the, or the jewel in the toad's head. You're after something that's guarded by some monstrous figure. You're going to seek? How committed to that, to that are you? And there's a total commitment in that in a fundamental way. It's like you should be humble enough to be open to learning, to radical transformation, to the probability that you're really wrong if you're not finding what you're seeking, and the willingness to sacrifice virtually everything of lesser value for that goal. Otherwise, you do not want it. You did not ask. You are not seeking. You did not knock on the door. And this, so This isn't church on Sunday. Meaning? Go to church on Sunday and you're going to find your salvation and a way forward that's better. So, no, I don't understand the I question. I mean, this is, this is a seven days a week. Right, right. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is the development of a vision. Now, you can construe consciousness as the implementer of, of the vision in, in the broadest sense. So, what we really confront as human beings isn't a deterministic world that runs like clockwork, that the past pushes forward in an algorithmic or deterministic manner. That isn't how the world works. The, the way the world works is that we confront a horizon of possibility that's not predictable. It's somewhat predictable the way a musical piece is predictable. So it's rule governed, but it's not predictable in a deterministic way. And it's full of possibility and potential. That's actually its nature. It's potential in its nature. And to maximize our, the quality of our interaction with that potential, we have to impose a vision on it and then pursue the vision. And so, when you do the future authoring program, well, that's what you're trying to do, is develop a vision. So here's the first exercise. It's like, okay, here's the deal, all right? You get to have what you need and what you want. Maybe even better, you get to have what you need and want if you were treating yourself properly, so imagine first of all that you were treating yourself properly because you actually cared for yourself. Okay, and, and say, is, say you don't. Yeah, well you How don't. How do you help somebody? Well, you at least ask them to open the door to the possibility that maybe they could. So just imagine that you did. Not that you are, that you could, but that, that you tried. You think, okay, I'm a valuable person, maybe. And if I was treating myself like I had intrinsic value, like if you were treating yourself like you were someone you loved, so you could imagine doing this for someone you actually cared about. Because most people care about someone that isn't them. So you, do you identify someone you care about? Well, you can, yes, you can. And say, because it, it does tell you, it's like, well, if, you, if you're not so good at caring for yourself, imagine someone you love and then pretend that you're bringing that attitude to bear on you with all your faults and inadequacies. I'm not being casual about this. It's hard for people to do this, right? Because we know our own flaws so deeply. It's hard for us to take care of ourselves. But imagine that you should take care of yourself and that you could and that you did. Just imagine that. So that's opening up at least the door, right? Yeah. And then you say, well, five years down the road, you get to have what you want and need. What is it? 
And so this is a deep question, So, because the question is this. Your life is going to be difficult, and it's going to be marked by suffering and tragedy. In all sorts of different ways. Disappointment and, and obstacle and betrayal and the whole panoply of human catastrophe. That's absolutely, 100%, definitely coming your way. Okay, so given that, and given that you want to live a life free of resentment and bitterness and premature aging and excess suffering, and that you don't want to be a burden to everyone around you, what would you have to have to make carrying that weight worthwhile? And that's a hard question, you know, it's like, what justifies your suffering? That isn't how am I going to be happy, it's what justifies your suffering. Well, ask yourself. You get to have what you want. If you're taking care of yourself, what would it be? Okay, and so you write for 15 minutes about what your life might be like five years down the road. If you got to have what you needed and wanted. And then we concretize it. You know, I had lots of clients and students who said, well, I don't know what to do with my life. What should I do with my life? And the first answer to that question is, that's not a very good question. Because it's like, what, do you want a one-line answer to what you should do with your life? Like, life is everything, and you want a one-line answer to everything. No. Bad question. You can imagine a desirable future, but, you, but it helps to particularize it. So, one of the things you might ask is, where do people find meaning? And the answer is, well, in multiple places. Here's some places people typically find meaning. So if clients came to me and they were depressed, first of all, I'd try to find out, are you depressed? Or do you just have a terrible life, or some combination of those two? And you might ask, what's the difference? And that's a really good question. If you're depressed, you have a good life, but you're suffering. So, and so what would it mean that you have a good life? Well, it means somewhat different things to different people, but you can kind of triangulate on it. Probably you have an intimate relationship, or at least you have the prospects of one. So at least you want one, and you, and you believe that maybe you could have one, if you don't have one. And probably, if you have a good life, you have one. You have some friends. They're real friends, right? You have some family members, children, perhaps, if not children, parents and siblings, or perhaps both grandchildren, you're nested inside a family, and your relationships with your family are desirable. You have a job or a career, and so if it's a job, well, then it's hard, and maybe you wouldn't have picked it as a vocation, but at least maybe you have good relationships with your co-workers, and you're doing something difficult, but that's actually socially productive and useful, and generates an income, so that's not nothing. You're educated to the level of your intellectual capability, or you have plans to do so, you're taking care of yourself mentally and physically, and you have a strategy for dealing with the realm of, of signal temptation, drug and alcohol abuse, and sexual misbehavior, and that sort of thing. And then we've added one more recently, at least conceptually, that you're, you've adopted a certain degree of civic responsibility, right? You're participating in the broader community in some manner. And if you're doing none of those, my life is meaningless. Are you doing any of these? No. Well, that's why it's meaningless. Those are the domains of meaning. And Oh yeah, the other one is uh, use, productive use of time outside of work. And so that could be creative endeavors of various sorts, right? To kind of pull in the artistic front. And so, if you're miserable and you have none of those things, the first thing to do, if you're a cognitive behavioral therapist with someone, is to say, well, how about we work on like one of these things to begin with? You know, you need some friends, you need to get out in the dating market, you need a job or a better job, you need an educational plan, like, you don't have a life, so you're, of course you're misery, miserable, because without sustaining life, mi without sustaining meaning, life is just tragedy. And so the lot, your lot is misery. And so anyways, we ask people to go through these eight different domains and say, okay, you can have what you want, but you have to aim at it. Sin means to miss the mark, by the way, it means to miss the target. That's what takes you away from God, is to miss the target. What target? Yeah! Right! What target? Right! You gotta at least know there's a target, then you gotta try to hit it. You know, and maybe you don't even know where the target is, but your aim isn't good, but at least you've set up a target now, and you can practice. And so, well, if you had an intimate relationship, what would it look like? If you had some friends, 
How would you like those friendships to be conducted? If you had a job or a career, what could it be if you had what you wanted, etc. Mm -hmm. So that's helpful. How and does the virtues and faults part of the present authoring come into the future authoring, do you think? Um, well, I think that by delineating out your virtues and your faults, you have some sense of the tools that you can bring to bear on your future plans and also the most likely temperamental obstacles that you might need to overcome. One of the things we do ask, and it sort of ties the present into the future authoring, is, uh, well, here's your plan. What obstacles do you see most likely to mm. emerge in your path? So say it's resent resentment. Yeah, and then how would you deal with that? How would you re And you have to think this through. Like, there's not a lot of hints in the, in the authoring, apart from the questions, because one of the things you learn as a therapist, it's been known for a very long time, is that giving people advice is not helpful. It's really much better necessary for people to come up with their own strategies because otherwise they're not locked into their value system properly, right? And so you, you can identify the problems and you need to come up with the solutions and maybe on this front you can't and you have to talk to someone more about that but generally people can come up with quite a few solutions. Right. So, so then we have people write, so now you're moving towards the promised land, let's say. So that's inspiring and that produces positive emotion because you experience positive emotion when you see yourself moving towards a valued goal. No valued goal, no positive emotion. That's how your systems are set up psychophysiologically. On the negative front, well maybe anger and bitterness and fear stop you. Okay, so what do you do with them? Well, we talked about cleaning them up a little bit with the other authoring, but here's another thing you can do. It's like, okay, now Take good stock of your sinful nature, let's say. You know what temptations you're prone to and what knock you off the beaten track and maybe you feel guilty about it. You know where your weaknesses are and you probably have some idea of just what kind of hell you could inhabit if you let those weaknesses get the upper hand. So why don't you just write about that for 15 minutes. So let's say this isn't what you could have in five years, it's the pit you could dig for yourself if you decided to, you know, just sit there or dig. Everyone has a sense of that, you know, for some people. My temptation probably would have been alcohol. I think your temptation, you told me, would have been, you would have been a street person. Yeah, yeah. And strange, eh, because it wasn't the same temptation for the two of us, but, mm -mm. but you knew it. Why do you think it was homelessness for you? Um, I think that I was probably not as much an advocate for myself as I needed to be. So would you, you would have just let yourself drift? Yeah, I think so. And was, there, and was there something about that that was tempting? I mean, it's tempting. abdication of responsibility. It's an abdication eh? of responsibility to, yeah. to myself, right? Well, and to everyone because else. Because I have, I have a responsibility to be the best person I can be. Yeah, that's annoying. Yeah, that's <laughs> annoying because that means that you, every day, you have to strive for that mm -hmm. and, and ask for that and be and and have some humil humility that you might be able to learn something every day Oof. to become a better person, right. you know, right? So there's all of that. But if you're homeless, you can just dispense with all of that. And I think I would, wouldn't do that anymore. But at some point in my life, I might, I might have mm -hmm. fallen in that direction. Mm -hmm. And I think that people, they, you know, they need some encouragement mm -hmm. that they yeah. need to take care of themselves. Yeah, well, I liked alcohol, you know, it, it calmed me in social situations. It made me feel a closer kinship to people and it was pretty good stimulant. And so it was a really good drug for me and I enjoyed it quite a lot, too much. Um, but I learned that I had better things to do. I wouldn't have stopped without better things to do. And that's and what did you mean by better things to do? Well, I was writing my book, Maps of Meaning, um, when I was still carousing as a graduate student. I'd started to put my life together by that point quite a bit, but I was still a party animal and very social. And, uh, but I found that I couldn't think hungover. And not only that, I couldn't handle the emotional tension of what I was dealing with intellectually. It was too, because you know, if you're hungover, your emotions are more sensitive, especially your anxiety. And the work I was doing was way too demanding emotionally because I was dealing with historical atrocity and the motivations for that was just too damn dark, you know, mm -hmm. to be dealing with hungover. Plus, once I had written a fair bit and was editing, once you've edited your work to a substantial degree, 
you have to use finer and finer gradations of judgment to continue to improve it. And if you're fuzzy minded at all, if you've impaired your judgment, when you edit, you can make it worse, not better. And then I also realized that the only times I really regretted my actions was when I was drinking. Because it disinhibits you, and that's fun. That can be really fun. But I'd wake up the next day and think, yeah, I was a little too provocative. I was a little too aggressive. I was a little too mean-spirited in my wit. A little too egotistical, or maybe more than little on all of those fronts. A little careless in my choice of partner. Um, a little uncontrolled in my social behavior in places I shouldn't have been because you know I was starting to well I was a graduate student and a teacher by that point mm -hmm. and I was interacting with professors say As in the, the social milieu grew, yeah you, well you it, wasn't it wasn't the time to be drunk mm -hmm. that just wasn't good that worked in northern Alberta to some degree in some subcultures but in those situations it just made me look like a fool well it made me into a fool not just look like one and then when you and I got married um, I didn't, and we were going to have kids, I thought, well, I'm not drinking when I have kids. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted children. Yeah, and, and you know, you want to grow up at that point. Besides, I was ready to dispense with all of that by then, pretty much. But, in any case, so you can imagine the hell you could inhabit. And then the advantage to that is, see, people are often afraid of moving forward. And no wonder. But, you should be way more afraid of not moving forward. And so, if you get that hell behind you, it's like, well, do I want to go there? Well, I don't have the effort or the energy. I'm not even sure that it's the right thing. It's like, well, do I want to go back there? It's like, no, definitely not that. And if you don't feel that, if you don't feel that hell, then you're not nearly as motivated as you could be. Because if you have any sense of just exactly how bloody dismal and dark things could get, then, and that's right there for you. And that was one thing that... I thought it was helpful. I thought it was helpful when I did the future authoring to um, think about where I would go if I went to the wrong place. Why? Well, it's just good to know how you uh, will fall apart. Yeah, well, and then you possible. can... Well, and you can also ask yourself, and, and studying historical atrocity also helped me with that. It's like, well, do you want to be... A, uh, what would you call a sadist? You're bitter and resentful. You want to hurt other people? Is that where you want to end up? You want to lie and deceive? Because that's where you end up if you lie and deceive. You want to be resentful and bitter? Because that's where you end up if you're resentful and bitter. Yeah, but, but sometimes, you know, people, they just don't know what to do about it. So your program helps them to make a plan. Yeah, well, and the plan is really... Look, we're visionaries, man. Human beings are visionaries. Really. Well, I found when I did the self-authoring, the 15 minutes of writing that I did, the dreaming I did yeah. when, I, when I wrote about my future and just dreamed of what it could be like if it was just what I wanted. Yeah. And then outlined the goals, because you outline goals after that yeah, in the yeah. future authoring. Those things that I had identified appeared in my life. Those... Yeah, well... And the, that was quite well, shocking to well, me. Well, the thing is... You, you, look at your, you look at the world through a goal-directed framework. And so when you switch your goals, what appears to you in the world switches. It's, not, it's mystical in a sense, but in another sense, it's just understandable. It's like, well, if I look that way, I see the TV and the couch. Mm -hmm. And if I look this way, I see you in the chair. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not that mysterious. But... What I've done is I've changed the reality that manifests itself to me just by changing the direction of my orientation. Well, we do that metaphysically as well. And so, for example, if you decide that you're going to be courageously trusting towards people when they offer you an opportunity, even though you're skeptical and timid, but you decide, no, I'm going to have some faith in people, so I'm going to be courageous and trusting, then when they open a door to you that's an opportunity, you'll think, oh, that's a door I could walk through, instead of thinking I'm moving into a trap. And that's, it's the same reality in some sense, but the, degree, the way that you're interacting with it changes, well, it can change, it can invert, it can change so radically that it barely looks like you're living in the same world. There are a lot of potential interpretations that you can validly lay on the world. 
and some of them are extremely positive and they still work. And wouldn't that be lovely if you could lay an incredibly positive vision on the world in a calculating and strategic manner, not an instrumental manner, right? Because you're aiming at something genuinely good and that would work. And that is how the world works. One of the things I loved, maybe we can end with this too, one of the things I loved about my clinical practice, I loved this. It was so good and I miss it. We are always working, always working. The best parts of me and my client were working together to make everything about their lives better. And it worked. You know, like I had lots of female clients who tripled their income in four years. They didn't even think that was possible. It's like, well, I don't make enough money. I'm barely making ends meet, single mothers. I have no idea what to do. I don't like my job. It's like, well, let's make a plan here. You know, what do you want? Well, I'd like to make this much money. Why don't we double that? And just, because you're going to aim at something. Some people do make more money than that. So maybe it could be you. Well, is that even, po it's not even possible. It's like, well, let's just assume that maybe it's possible and see what you'd have to do. Well, you've got to get your CV together. Well, it's full of holes. Okay, well, let's fix the holes. Okay, now you've got to get a plan. Well, I'm not very good at interviews. Okay, let's practice interviewing until you're not just good at it. You're, man, you're looking forward to it, right? Well, I don't want to send out my CV because I'm afraid I'm going to get rejected. It's like, well, you're going to get rejected 98% of the time. That's the baseline for CV rejection, resume rejection. So factor that into consideration. Send out 200. Assume you'll get four interviews. And, and then set up a strategy so that you can do that without it being burdensome. And, and then, you know, I had clients who were in such dire situations that all I could do was really help buffer them against that. But they were a minority. I wouldn't say more than 5% of my practice fell into that category. Everyone else, it was like just rapid improvement on all fronts, you know. And that's such fun. And it's... There isn't anything more practical, this is the thing too, there is nothing more practical than developing a, a vision. It's not some pie in the sky exercise, it's without a vision you're chaotic and fragmented and hopeless and disappointed and someone can stop you just by putting up a single obstacle. You're a house divided amongst itself, you have no forward movement. You're, you're not enthusiastic, and that's to be filled with the Spirit of God, by the way. And your life is a sequence of disappointments and frustrations and tragedies, and you're a leaf blowing in the wind. And that is not what you're called to be. That's not what you're called to be. You're called to be a visionary constructor of the paradisal vision. Mm -hmm. Really? Really? That's who you are? Terrible as that is to apprehend. And so... Well, what do we have to lose? We already will lose everything we have to lose. Yeah. Right? We're all in in this game, man. So, there's... Whether you want it to be this way or not, you are betting everything on your life. Thank you, George.